Good afternoon. My name is David Jones, and I am the Executive Director for the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, CERL. Thank you for joining us for this, our seventh in a virtual briefing series on the legal dimensions of the Israel-Hamas war. The ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas raises critical questions about the application and interpretation of the law of armed conflict, also known as LOAC, also known as international legal principles governing the conduct of war. war. Searle is pleased to host experts in national security, military strategy, and the law of war to discuss these critical topics. Searle is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security, warfare, and democratic government. Affiliated with the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania, Searle draws upon the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in times of war and contemporary transnational conflicts. Searle brings together scholars, policymakers, professionals across the legal, military, intelligence, and business sectors to research, analyze, and make policy recommendations that address today's challenging issues such as domestic violent extremism and the use of autonomous weapons and the protection of civilians in war zones. Searle carries out its mission through conferences, symposia, research, policy papers, and blog publishing, student projects, and other activities. We are pleased to host a summer internship program every year for students interested in national security field. Our application portal for this year's cohort is now open on our website. If you are a law or graduate student interested in the opportunity to know or know of a student who may be interested, please find the link and apply. Uh, that in our chat will be also in there. Now for a few housekeeping items before the session begins. Questions will be taken from the audience in the last 20 minutes or so of this presentation. To ask a question, please enter your question into the Q&A box at any point during the conversation and click send. This event will be recorded and posted on Searle's YouTube channel in short order. All right, now I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Professor Claire Finkelstein, who founded Searle in 2012 and has served as its faculty director since its inception. She's the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. Claire, off to you. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, this is our seventh uh, briefing. Uh, we have been meeting weekly, and now we are meeting a uh, bi-weekly. Uh, and so our, these briefings are a little bit more um, spaced further apart than they were before. Um, as has been our custom, uh, we review a little bit recent events since the last briefing, and so I'm just going to spend a minute to do that before I introduce our guests. Uh, so as we talked a little bit about last time, of course, there were attacks uh, on a Jordan, uh, Jordanian U.S. base, um, and the U.S. has engaged in strong reprisals since then. Um, very recently, matters have become quieter. We are not hearing so much about any counter threats to those uh, reprisals. Uh, so we will see whether or not the U.S. is directly engaged in combat or in further operations as this moves forward. Uh, however, several days ago, uh, there were rockets that hit in northern Israel. At least one person was killed and several more were injured. This threatens to open up a significantly a second front in this war, namely in the north and from Lebanon. Um, more recently, the IDF and Shin Bet carried out an extraordinary rescue for two hostages held above ground in the Rafia area. Both were men. Uh, why the Israeli government decided to rescue those particular hostages rather than others is not clear, but presumably it was based on opportunity and feasibility. Uh, we're also not clear yet on what the impact was of that rescue, whether it has had any impact on uh, other hostages. In the course of the rescue mission, there were many uh, casualties on the Palestinian side, some estimates as high as um, 67 or more. Uh, now, um, recent testimony in the Knesset has borne witness to the sexual violence that occurred on October 7th. The sheer extent and systematicity of this is shocking. 
uh, we are extraordinarily privileged to have with us two experts on the use of sexual violence in war, uh, and in particular, uh, Kochav, uh, who, um, uh, Kochav uh, El Kayim Levi, who has established uh, a commission, the Civil Commission on October 7th, Crimes by Hamas Against Women and Children. She is the principal author of the National Report on Gender Mainstreaming in Times of Emergencies, which was adopted by the Israeli government in June of 2022. She was elected as one of the most promising young leaders under 40 in Israel by the Marker magazine in 2022, uh, and recently co-authored the analysis of the implications of the government's legal reform on the lives of women in Israel. Uh, Dr. Ekayem Levy is the Sophie Davis Professor, uh, excuse me, the Sophie Davis Fellow on Gender Conflict Resolution and Peace at the Leonard Davis Institute for International Relations at Hebrew University. She teaches human rights law, international law, climate justice, and feminist theories at Hebrew U and at Reichman University. Uh, we are delighted to have her with us. She was also with us at Penn Law School as a visitor. Let me now introduce uh, Dr. Diane Orentlicher. Professor uh, Orentlicher has lectured and published widely on issues of transitional justice, international criminal law, and other areas of public international law, and has testified before the United States Senate and House on a range of issues relating to both domestic human rights laws and U.S. foreign policy. Professor Orentlicher has served in various public positions, including as the Deputy for War Crimes Issues in the U.S. Department of State, from uh, 2009 to 2011, United Nations independent expert on combating impunity on appointment by the UN Secretary General, and special advisor to the High Commissioner on National Minorities of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe on uh, secondment from the US Department of State. Professor Orentlicher's book, Some Kind of Justice, the ICTY's impact in Bosnia and Serbia published by Oxford University Press in 2018, has been described as the definitive account of the ICTY. Please join me in welcoming Professor Orentlicher. So thank you so much to both of you uh, for being with us today. Uh, we could not have two greater experts in this area. And uh, Kohav, I'm going to start with you and ask you to talk a little bit about what led you to start a civil commission to examine uh, gender-based crimes on October 7th. Uh, and how has your uh, commission been proceeding? Thank you. So first of all, thank you so much, Professor Femhishten, uh, for having this event and to Cyril. Um, I actually miss Penn a lot. I did my doctorate at Penn Law. Um, and I was also uh, the Pamela Human Rights Scholar, so it's just, uh, I told my children that I feel like I'm coming back to my school. So, <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so if it's okay, um, I, I'd like to start by sharing a bit more uh, about myself before the 7th of October. I always feel the need to just anchor myself before everything happened. Um, so you mentioned a few things, uh, so I'll just say that I teach international law, feminist theories, uh, climate justice, human rights law at Reichman University and Hebrew University. Um, as you said, I'm the Peace and uh, Conflict Resolution Fellow of Hebrew University. I was very much involved um, in the protests here in Israel. Uh, we really struggled for gender equality in the month before the 7th of October. And uh, as you mentioned, I drafted um, the report on the legal implications of the government uh, uh, legal reform uh, on women. And also, um, I was working with the National Security Council um, post-COVID on, a, on a, a report that was adopted as a government resolution on women during emergencies, gender man mainstreaming during emergencies. And I mentioned these bits uh, of information about myself because it's really important to what happened after the 7th of October. Um, so just, we really fought uh, for women's rights and we fought for the LGBTQ community here in Israel. And then the 7th of October happened. Uh, on the 7th of October, uh, I was actually with my father. 
Uh, he was hospitalized that day at Sheba Hospital. He was ill for a long time. Um, and I was with him and we started to get a lot of uh, reports about what's going on in the part, southern part of Israel. And it was, um, I want to start with that, with that uh, that it was really shocking for us. We didn't believe this is happening. Israel is such a small country and this was happening less than a couple of hours from where we live. Um, thousands of terrorists getting into uh, the communities. Um, I shared this with you, Claire, that it felt like an existential threat, that this is going very, we also feared um, multiple fronts um, are going to develop of this, of this attack. Um, it was really frightening above all that day. And we started getting reports of, um, of children and families being buried alive, children that were calling, um, calling their relatives that uh, their parents were being, um, have been murdered and they are hiding in the closets. It was just shocking. Parents saying um, that um, their children were murdered. People, I'm, I'm just pointing out the kind of, it was very, very shocking. People were t uh, calling their relatives to say final goodbyes. It was devastating. Um, and so in the human rights circles, we got even more information than the general public on what's going on. So that was difficult. I think the greatest realization as an international law scholar was that we're really seeing war crimes before our eyes. We really, we saw the people being dragged into Gaza, women, children, babies, really dragged into the Gaza Strip. And it was a uh, I realized I didn't think I can tell you that honestly I didn't think that we're going to see something um, I didn't think there is going to be some um, an issue with the international community I thought um, this is the horrific crimes and the horrific scenes that we've seen here will be quickly addressed and so on the very first week that I, wo I worked um, within um, to make sure that women I knew that um, the, the emergency teams are, are being formed and I was really uh, more concerned that women would take part in those uh, circles. Um, so yes, so a week uh, into the war or a week after the attack, not into the war, a week after the attack, when we started to see that there is really an inappropriate uh, response, either a silence of some uh, UN bodies or responses that were seemed inadequate to reflect the kind of horrific scenes that we've seen we decided to gather a group of uh, um, of experts in international law gender equality we were shocked really by the fact that the un was not able to respond and i um, i'll share more what do i mean by response but we thought very naively i thought very naively that once we will um, send them the most credible information that we can about what happened here it would be, um, we'll see a change. We'll see, we'll see them react very quickly. We, we'll see them, um, maybe I'll, I'll explain. When I'm talking about a response, I'm talking about first very initially to report the 7th of October, what happened here. Um, secondly, to, off, to um, condemn the crimes, to offer, not to offer, uh, I want to say to condemn the crimes, express solidarity. This is what I wanted to say. And thirdly, to offer help. This is what they do. This is what they usually do. And we haven't even seen them initially reporting the crimes. And so, as I started saying very naively, I thought that once we will send them the most credible information that we had at the time, we will see this response uh, um, happening very quickly. And so we did, we sent a civil petition. We sent a, a petition in the name of NGOs here in Israel human rights organizations really calling upon the new the, the UN to help to condemn the crimes to uh, to take action to release the hostages and what I did is that I drafted a report um, that was presented to President Biden and to his staff a report uh, that we drafted a group of colleagues and was joined by more than 180 international law and human rights experts we try to give them, as I said, the most credible information we had at the time, outlining the kinds of crime we've already known happening to women and children, specifically addressing gender-based crimes and crimes against women and children and the violence that we've seen here. And uh, by the end of the week, it took a week, 
um, w in which we gathered information. And I usually say that I felt the responsibility to see everything, to see whatever I can, to bear witness to what happened. Um, I, I think I saw too much too soon. And uh, I sent it to, I sent the information to every UN agency relevant uh, to women's rights, to children's rights, um, really both formally and informally. And when I saw, I sent it from my Hebrew University account. And when I saw that they're not responding, I asked my colleagues to send it as well. All of us sent it. And we were texting with each other. Did they respond? Did they answer you? And I'm sorry to say that we didn't get any response um, for days, for weeks to come. And it was, I just want to emphasize that it was a cry for help. We asked them for help. We attached the report, but we said, we need your help. This is what's going on. And we really also asked for your guidance. And I'm sorry to, to say that we didn't even get a thank you note. Um, and that, uh, I'll say very quickly what happened afterwards. Afterwards, I was invited uh, to speak uh, before the CEDO committee, uh, before five members of the CEDO committee. It was uh, regardless to the 7th of October atrocities. And uh, I was invited to represent the, the um, protest movement, the women's uh, protest movement here in Israel. And a day before my speech, uh, the CEDO, CEDO is the most um, important international committee on women's rights, it's an experts committee. Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women at the UN. They, each of members, each member of the committee received our report, received information from us, and they released a statement a day before my, um, the day before my speech, not mentioning the 7th of October. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, not mentioning the hostage taking. And I can tell you personally, it was uh, devastating. I didn't think that I will be able to. Um, Sorry, I didn't think that I would be able to speak that day to deliver the speech. I thought also I, I should share that there were a lot of expectation for me from all around Israel. People were sending me information. Kohav, please tell them this happened. Kohav, please tell them this happened. I felt a huge burden on my shoulder to share everything. And uh, the fact that they were unable to even mention the 7th of October was difficult. Um, now, Kohab, I'm going to come back. I want to come back to the UN and its response or lack thereof in a minute. Before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about what your commission has found. Exactly. And, so I'm getting let, there. and let me briefly flip to Diane for a moment. And while I'm doing that, if you have any way of turning up your microphone, <laughs> that would be great. It's a little bit hard to hear you. Uh, we need the volume a little bit higher. Uh, or, or get a little closer. So while you're working on that, Diane, let me ask you, from what you have read, from what you have learned about this, and you're, you've been very involved as well in, in, in speaking and learning and um, uh, working on these uh, issues, um, uh, and in this particular uh, instance, how would you characterize the crimes that you have learned about. How grand a scale is this? Uh, how significant are these crimes? Um, first, thank you for inviting me to participate in this program and for doing it. It's a very important issue. Um, and I appreciate your shining a spotlight on it. It's also a real honor to be on any program with Kohav, who is doing tremendous work under the most difficult circumstances. Um, and when she spoke earlier about personally watching the horribly um, graphic, uh, terrifying videos, that takes great courage and it stays with you the rest of your life. And you can never unsee what she has seen. And um, we owe her a debt for doing that. So legally, um, and I take your question to be a, a question of law, there's no question that the crimes excuse me, committed by Hamas on October 7th, and I'm going to focus on the crimes of sexual violence, are war crimes, very serious war crimes, um, including obviously uh, crimes of rape and other crimes of sexual violence. They also committed uh, war crimes of um, unlawful killing, uh, taking of hostages, on and on and on. There's a fairly long list of serious war crimes. But 
In addition, um, to me, it's clear that they also constitute crimes against humanity, um, which uh, I don't want to, that just the legal definition is pretty long, but um, it involves certain kinds of inhumane acts um, committed as part of a, an attack against a civilian population pursuant to um, a, a state or other organizational policy. Um, and uh, what, and, and I'm sorry, I should say uh, a widespread or systematic attack. And what struck me as soon as I learned details about the sexual violence committed on October 7th, and unfortunately um, since then, is that they were systematic um, and they were widespread. And uh, I, I had the um, privilege of speaking on a number of panels the week before last with several of the people who um, were summoned to help prepare victims of um, the October 7th attack for burial. And, and what they found as they started performing this um, sacred and terrible task was that they started seeing patterns emerge. Um, the, the women who were prepared for burial came from many different locations um, of Hamas's attack. Uh, and there were patterns that became obvious and they were patterns of sexual mutilation, as well as um, something uh, that can only have been rapes from going by the evidence um, that their bodies bore witness to. But in addition to um, violent rape, uh, rape is always violent, but um, but but there was evidence of you know extreme use of violence. There was um, patterns of mutilation of women's um, sexual organs, their breasts, and obliteration of faces. Um, and and again, it's the kind of pattern that could not be random. This was not spontaneous random violence. It was systematic. And so I think um, the rubric of crimes against humanity is not only legally fitting, but particularly appropriate because symbolically crimes against humanity tell us that something was done that was um, not only widespread or systematic, and in this case, both, but also an assault against the very humanity of the victims and against fundamental precepts of humanity to which we have to be committed um, no matter what side you sympathize with in a conflict. Right. And Diane, if you could just, uh, and then Koka, if I'm going to come back to you, um, but if you could just help us to understand, and maybe there's no way to understand this, but why would anyone fighting a war or initiating a war, conducting an attack, want to use sexual violence as a method of war in this systematic way, in this planned, organized, systematic way that you've described? I think there, I mean, it's, it, of course, it's unexplainable because it's so horrific. It's, um, I, I can't get uh, my own mind around the fact that anyone would do this and even less they would plan it. Um, but but they're obviously sending a signal of terror uh, to a wider community. Um, they are demeaning women in particular and sending a message that we can violate um, not just uh, you know Israeli citizens and and by the way, uh, quite a few others. I, I believe um, as many as forty other countries nationals were. Um, victims on on uh, October 7th. But but they were saying we can destroy something um, very sacred, which is um, the women who are um, fundamental to every community and and silence them. We can silence them. We can make their bodies spoils of war. And through that, we can terrorize and traumatize an entire nation. But I, that's the best I can do. I find it um, deeply hard, Very inexplicable, and it's important to point out here that there is no legitimate equivalence of sexual violence in valid conflict, in uh, legal absolutely. conflict. So absolutely. while while uh, each side in a conflict is targetable, um, first of course there's no targeting civilians, but second of all there is no valid use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. And I'm so glad you said that, Claire, because that should be obvious 
but it it's a point that was hard fought. Um, as you may know, um, there was evidence of sexual violence introduced uh, before the Nuremberg Tribunal, but not a whisper of that was to be found in the judgment. And our experience, for the most part, with some exceptions, um, after World War II, was that sexual violence against women was um, kept in the shadows, again, with some exceptions, but for the most part. Um, and the message was, uh, this is something that's inevitable as a byproduct of war, or it's a lesser crime, or it's embarrassing to talk about it. And it took decades um, for human rights activists and for women's organizations and for states, diplomats, to say, no, that is not acceptable. In no way is um, using women's bodies as a weapon of war uh, a byproduct of war, an inevitable byproduct of war. It is a very grave war crime. And, and of course, the world, the world is still grappling, of course, with uh, same side violence in war, namely uh, the use of Korean comfort women, so-called, in uh, by the Japanese Imperial Army during the Second World War, which is, continues a, a remarkably to be a contentious issue, to be an it's issue contested. that continues to make significant strife uh, right. between Japan and Korea. So, right. Kokhav, let me turn back to you now and ask you if you can tell us um, what did what has your commission found so far. And I know this will be difficult to talk about, but I think it's really important that we put this uh, on the table early on in the discussion. Yes. So I'll say that it, of what we're seeing, it's really that Hamas is, uh, I want to just to continue Diane's, what Diane said, it really feels like Hamas is, has mimicked the worst uh, ways to inflict pain. Um, the kinds of crimes that we've seen um, even make us um, think about the, the the way we can uh, archive them and document them. We can have a um, um, staff that is constantly seeing this because this, this is very traumatizing to see the kinds of crimes. The fact that they came in ready to document everything is also uh, attesting the, the fact that they aimed to terrorize us for generations to come. And I think um, their attack, their, their, their targeting of women and children is really to, has been to destroy us, to destroy our most basic, um, destroy these communities. I see them now, they're not even able to return to where it happened. We see um, burnt bodies, mutilated bodies of women. I think uh, we talked uh, the other week among us that it really seemed like as if Hamas has uh, conducted the perfect war crimes against women because they didn't just rape, they raped and then um, they uh, they burned, uh, uh, they murdered and burned the body. So uh, what we really are seeing, and I think I discussed this with Diana before, is that uh, sometimes the um, what we're seeing is bodies that are half burned in ways that you can see the lower part of the body is naked. And I'm thinking about all of those that were burned to ashes and we'll never know what happened to them. So we're lucky to have some of the bodies left in this condition. Uh, we also see bodies that have been uh, tortured in ways uh, that we see uh, nails, nails like uh, the ones used to hang pictures, uh, um, put in different genital uh, places in the genital area. It's really the worst, um, I think, they, they try to inflict the worst pain they, pain they could. And I want to just say, um, once we understood that uh, we're not getting any response, uh, once we understood that that, um, that there, there is even difficulty among UN organizations to acknowledge the 7th of October, to recognize what's happened here, we decided to establish this commission and to gather really every piece of information and uh, to send uh, credible information to international, to the international community. Um, and as I said, even the documentation mission is really the hardest thing that I ever, uh, I've ever done personally, and I've done hard things in my past. Um, the collection of these materials, we still get um, reports, sometimes in the middle of the night, Kochav, have you heard about that? Uh, have you heard about this case? And, so we are gathering everything in um, 
Would so I, I understand that the commission is doing its best yeah. to verify the accounts. That's a very challenging thing to do, especially without direct access to forensic um, evidence. Um, so I want to ask you a couple questions about the collection of, of forensic evidence. Um, has the government, has the Israeli government shared any of the forensic evidence that it has collected with the commission? So it's uh, it's important. And if you can uh, just try to speak up a little bit, because it's very hard. Yes. To speak. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is yeah, it better thank like you. this? Yeah, thank you. That is better like that. And I apologize because that's no, it's hard okay. to hold. But yeah. It's really okay. Thank you. So it's an excellent question. Uh, we are uh, an, a non-governmental body. Um, it's important for me to stress that we are an independent commission, an independent commission. We do not accept governmental funds. I was even thinking about creating an MOU with the government to receive information from them. But then I understood that when I'm talking with my counterparts around the world, with human rights organizations around the world, I think uh, the most important for them to verify is that we're not accepting uh, information from the government and we are collecting this ourselves and this is an independent effort and I want to share with you perhaps one of the best advice that I get uh, that I got early on when I established the commission from Professor Catherine McKinnon we actually met with her uh, the very um, beginning when it all started and it we were already, I told the, the commission uh, members, uh, the experts, the, my colleagues, to be very ready. She's the best legal scholar in the world, uh, specifically on these crimes and especially on um, crimes against women. And, um, and we were very anxious before meeting her. And first of all, she came on Zoom. And she was amazing. She was the first one to ask us, are, we okay? are you okay? She didn't care about proof. And uh, it's important to stress that the burden of proof on our shoulders is unprecedented. We are required as an NGO, we are now partnering with tech companies that will be able to verify that our evidence is AI proof with forensic experts, with medical experts. Just the effort, the, the burden of proof is really unbelievable. And the way that even the, um, the attempts to sabotage our work and the threats that I'm getting personally. Personal I want to say personal, personal threats. threats against yes. you. We are, we are not even yes. revealing where the commission is situated. Um, and so I want to say just about the, the conversation with Professor McKinnon, first of all, that she didn't care about the, the proof. She just wanted to see that we are okay. We were able to start a different conversation, another level of conversation. We were sharing with her our fears. And then I told her, uh, Professor McKinnon, this is going to be held by the government and p perhaps this should be a mission held by the government and maybe the government is going to have much more information that we are going to collect in a month from now. They're going to collect much more testimonies than, our, than us. Um, and she said, um, no, even if you'll have 1% of what the government has, this is going to be the most important 1%. You need to, to tell the stories of women, of what happened to women, their experiences in a way that uh, keeps you independent. This should be a non-governmental effort because some of the victims would want to come to you to tell you what happened. The survivors are want to come to someone who is not the police. And I think she has given me a lot of strength to carry this mission very early on. So, so let's talk about a few other aspects um, about the Commission's work and, and um, this burden of proof that you talk about, which is, of course, as lawyers, um, and anticipating possible uh, criminal trials and prosecutions. We know that we need to keep our eyes on the proof. Um, yet it's rather extraordinary when you look at the fact that this has been already, already without the commission, without anybody lifting a finger, well documented by the perpetrators themselves who have taken video, who have used social media to advertise uh, and to disseminate what they were doing. Um, so what is the reason for this um, especially high burden of proof? And, and I will just add here a personal note, which is that coming through the Me Too movement in the United States, States which was, you know, has been a revelation and extraordinary and opened up windows for all of us uh, women 
um, to suddenly feel that there was a platform to discuss sexual violence and sexual harassment and to have women be believed and to have women feel confident to go into court and bring actions and to start winning uh, judgments. Um, but then to see the reaction to the stories of Israeli women and, uh, and, and to have the denialism when the proof is right before your eyes um, is baffling to me. Has, has been one, I mean, there has been denialism about all of the crimes of October 7th, but there has been a special level of denialism around the sexual crime. So I wonder if uh, both of you could comment on that and, and how can we understand that? Yeah. Um, yes. So I'll say, uh, I hope you're you're not hearing my kids screaming uh, uh, behind the door. <laughs> so I'll just say that uh, I'm, I wasn't surprised that uh, th these crimes are denied. Usually uh, sexual crime, sexual abuse is denied. Uh, we have to also understand that these crimes were recognized internationally only recently and um, only in the end of the 90s. But I was surprised, I was deeply surprised and shocked to see this um, lack of response and denial uh, by UN organizations, by those who are supposed to protect us, those who, that were unable to very strongly condemn uh, the crimes, not all of them, not all of them, I should stress that. It's important to acknowledge those who did respond. Uh, but when I spoke with, uh, um, when I gave my speech at the UN, I told them that um, I'm really terribly um, sorry to see them um, adopting the same denial campaign, the same denial mechanisms that usually are inflicted on women on the individual level now being inflicted on us collectively. Um, the fact that I told him this is really de 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 delegitimizing the international legal system. There is a reason because these crimes are defined as crimes against humanity. It's not only a betrayal in us as Israeli women, the fact that they weren't, weren't able to condemn the crimes, weren't believing us. It's against our values, all of us as humanity. It's against um, universal values. This is what, why it was so devastating to me. This is... I chose to teach international law. I chose to teach human rights law, despite the cynicism here in Israel uh, on on the ability of those organizations to reflect an unbiased uh, opinion on Israel. And I chose to to teach this. And I thought and I thought they are really failing us, failing us as humanity, yeah. and uh, dehuman dehumanizing us. Um, and I think now. Uh, they have to take strong actions in order to correct this. I'm I'm actually very worried about the denial, the erasing of the narratives. I also saw you, some um, UN officials that have, unfortunately, um, it seems like they have even referred to the 7th of October, not only at the UN, but outside of it, referring to the 7th of October it, it, as if it didn't happen in Israel, as if it happened in um another place and i have to say for for the sake of it's it's important for me to stress that i've been very much involved in the peace efforts here in israel connecting women both palestinian arab israelis and i think uh, to to connect us um perhaps to to offer another future to our children and this murderous attack uh, that hamas has conducted here has really destroyed all of our efforts um and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we'll see an end to this soon, and uh, that we'll be able to to start, I don't know, healing as a nation and healing. Right. Uh, and the and the first thing, of course, that we need to do is to is to have the truth come out and to have the crimes documented and uh, to have the full array and the scope uh, of what happened on that day. Uh, well documented. Diane, what are your thoughts about the sort of heavy burden of proof here and the and the denialism issue that we were just discussing with Kochav? So um, as Kochav indicated, there are two phenomena which are related but distinct. One is um, a the, the initial silence or relative silence, and the other is the denialism. And the silence was surprising 
but uh, not entirely in, uh, unexplainable. Um, at a time when um, many of us are absolutely, rightly, justifiably, urgently concerned about the toll on civilians in Gaza, I think many people thought, uh, incorrectly in my view, that they had to choose sides and not speak up for Israeli victims, um, no matter how horrific the attacks. And that was disturbing, even if it was somewhat understandable, because again, a fundamental precept of human rights and humanitarian law is that the protections apply to all sides, no matter who your government is. And um, that's been a, you know, the starting point for human rights and humanitarian law. Um, and so to see people feel that they had to choose was disturbing. But a whole other level um, of concern came in the form of denialism. And, and as Kochav indicated, the demands for, quote, proof from sources like Kochav was, in my experience, something of a whole new order. Um, I, I uh, spoke in a number of countries a couple of weeks ago about the situation that we're talking about here. And um, at, uh, the leader of an NGO in Paris said at one of these events that she had been doing this work for decades, that she had been doing work documenting and speaking up about violence against women for decades. And that this was the first time in her experience that reporters and others demanded proof from her and said, what is your proof? So there is something um, fundamental and quite worrying about the, the you know, uh, the burden of proof um, that people, in the sense of expectations, people just don't want to believe what they're seeing. And it's more than that. It's a mobilization of denialism, um, which again, I've never seen um, people marshalling uh, efforts to say that a meticulously reported um, article by the New York Times a couple of months ago about sexual violence shouldn't be believed. And and so there's, there's something um, disturbing going on. The last thing, uh, and, and I, it pains me because that, threatens 30 years of progress in combating sexual violence and having it close to unified stand globally against it. That's very disturbing, but it's also very disturbing because it's re-traumatizing people in Israel. When people like the woman I mentioned earlier who prepared corpses for burial, describe what they saw, which was deeply traumatizing. And every time they have to retell it, it's traumatizing, That's but right. they do it because they want to bear witness. They feel they must bear witness. And then journalists say, what is your proof? Right. Well, right. I prepared these bodies one after another, day after day for burial. And, and that's re-traumatizing for them. Um, so I have, I have that New York Times article. In fact, I dug out, I, I am a pack rat on New York Times issues. And in preparation for today, I pulled out my old physical copy of this. And this New York Times article, which was meticulously um, researched and written, uh, is dated December 31st. Now, that does raise something, however, about the New York Times and other news agencies. These attacks occurred on October 7th. This is the first major story that the New York Times ran covering this, these crimes. It took until the end of December. Comment. <laughs> I, I'll just say that they were here from, the, from October 8th, if I'm not mistaken. They were here on the ground very early, uh, collecting um, evidence, working. I think they anticipated, in a way, the denial. They already saw what we we're experiencing. Uh, Diana mentioned- You can that. hold your microphone again, Koka. Oh, sorry. sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, maybe they anticipated the denial and they wanted to be very careful about how yes. they report this. And they, um, uh, I know they've been in touch with us. They've been in touch with multiple uh, people around uh, uh, around Israel with survivors, with, with families. And I want to say um, that this was extremely difficult. I um, wanted to mention another thing, but perhaps the fact that uh, what worries me the most is the fact that uh, 
I think the cruelty of the crimes makes them makes them also unbelievable. For us, it even took a while. Did this happen? Did you get the report about that? Have you heard about that? We were shocked. We, we were very cautious, even uh, us, to, to share information with journalists because we knew things that we weren't sure are, are true because they were so horrific that we, we were shocked that that they were happening. I, I didn't think, I think it is hard to comprehend it. So um, Diane mentioned Sherry, Sherry Mendez. I got her reports very early. She prepared the bodies for burial. She described the, the, the faces of women shot in their faces in ways that it seems systematic to erase their face, their genitals, their pelvic bones broken. Their uh, bodies are mutilated in various ways that just, anyway, I want to say that the cruelty is also adding another um, factor in the denial and the fact that we need to be very worried about where gender-based crimes and war crimes against women are going. The kind of cruelty is difficult to prevent. And I mentioned in another, um, just to, in another event uh, earlier, that I'm not sure the basic concepts or the traditional concept of international criminal law would be able to deter those terrorists because they have won, really. They have um, they have succeeded, and I'm, I'm I need I feel like we need to really redefine international criminal law. Think about the mechanisms that can create deterrence uh, that can prevent those crimes against women in the future. So, if you let's I want to quickly cover two other big topics, <laughs> uh, and then let in uh, our questions, read some of the questions in the Q&A. So let's come back to the topic of the UN and the um, problematic responses of the UN. There was a UN women's group that um, said nothing about it, finally tweeted, exed <laughs> a response with regard to the crimes, uh, sexual crimes on October 7th and within 24 hours had removed the tweet. Um, why is the UN, especially UN's women's groups, so afraid to identify this as a crime? Diane, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I think Kochav has uh, been so engaged with them. Uh, she's a better source on this, but I would note that the um, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General on Conflict-Related Violence, she has a long title, so I, I may have um, gotten some of the words wrong, was in Israel on a fact-finding mission recently um, and hopefully uh, will do a better job than um, some of the other UN organizations in responding to this. Um, Kochav, I don't know if you want to say anything more about this. Um, I think at the beginning, um, I tried to explain it to myself, even as an expert, why th is this happening? So there are structural structural reasons. The fact that the UN does not have uh, agencies here, especially UN women. Um, what else? Uh, perhaps the, the, the issue is so politically charged. But then as days went by, as weeks that went by, and they were unable to find a proper way, even a general way to condemn the crimes. I just, I became very, I, as I said, I saw two processes. One is the, the dehumanization of us as Israelis. As I said, I asked them, is there international law for Israeli women? Is it going to protect us? At a certain point, it raised the question in my head again and again and again, are we even human? Are they going to refer to what happened to us? What's happening to us? It didn't end. It didn't end. Um, people are very traumatized here every day, the grief. And I want to acknowledge the suffering in both sides. Um, and um, the second thing I want to mention that the fact that it dehumanized us really made me think about the um, the the anti-Semitic uh, sentiments of uh, that were. Uh, arising that I felt like if they're not even willing to address or to mention the 7th of October, this is really troubling. This should worry all of us. And again, uh, perhaps the second thing I want to mention is the demonization. I felt not only me, that they are, they are responding. They are just not responding to the entire conflict, to everything that has happened. And I have to mention that we are not... Um, there are many voices here in Israel, all of us, uh, people from 
Christian, uh, Muslims, uh, Jewish, all of us were uh, attacked. And I felt like at a certain point they are they demonizing us as Israelis. So these two processes happening together, the, demon, the dehumanization and the demonizing was very troubling. And I'm, I hope it's not too late for them to uh, act and act very um, vigorously so against what happened and to recognize. And I'm also hopeful about um, Pramila Spetten uh, visit last week, the, the special representative on uh, sexual abuse. Um, I'm hoping she will find ways to recognize what happened. And of course, uh, I really want to highlight here the importance of Kohab's work in Israel uh, and uh, to the uh, to the Israeli audience. Um, I first learned about Kohab's work from the First Lady of Israel on a visit, a recent visit to Israel, uh, when I had the opportunity to speak to her after that visit, and she said, "You must." Uh, uh, talk to to Kohav and uh, uh, learn more about her commission because it is having a huge impact uh, in Israel and and we hope all around the world. Let's pivot now briefly uh, because we won't be able to do this justice and I hope that you will uh, both come on again to help us talk about this. But um, we want to talk about what eventual uh, trials might look like. Uh, and this is uh, very difficult, um, especially because um, m many of the victims did not survive. So they will not be able to be witnesses at these trials. Um, uh, but um, there are different models. Uh, of course, Diane, you're an expert in the ICTY. Uh, this is a, a model of an international prosecution. Uh, in Ukraine, the model of conducting war crimes trials has been much more local, uh, where the idea is we Ukrainians can conduct our own trials, we appreciate advice from other countries, but we do not need an international tribunal, um, for the most part. Uh, and then there's the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, and there's some indication that the ICC may be interested in looking at this. What is the best model of prosecution in this case. And I can imagine that prosecution really differs from case to case, situation to situation. And prosecuting war crimes in this context, especially crimes of sexual violence, uh, may be different from prosecuting war crimes in Ukraine, for example. Diane, can you, can you speak to this? Yeah, so I think in many conflicts, including Ukraine and Israel, um, there is not strictly a, a, an either or choice. Um, uh, as, as you indicated, Ukraine has an abundance of prosecutors assisted by other countries um, investigating crimes of sexual violence. But there is also um, a case uh, in the International Criminal Court. And there are also other countries that have universal jurisdiction. So if a perpetrator shows up in those countries, um, they might be prosecuted in those countries' courts. Um, so we, we often have a multiplicity of simultaneous um, prosecutions in different jurisdictions. In Israel, um, the, the, uh, all that said, um, the basic model of the International Criminal Court is that it gets involved when states that have jurisdiction in local courts are unable or unwilling to bring the perpetrators to justice. Mm -hmm. um, and Israeli prosecutors are investigating these crimes and there is a um, a vibrant judicial system. So the principal venue will be um, Israeli courts, uh, but also, as I think I mentioned earlier, a number of other countries are starting to investigate crimes committed by Hamas against their own nationals. So we have um, national uh, jurisdictions outside of Israel beginning investigations. I think that's important. Um, partly for the reasons we've been talking about. And, and by that, I mean, there has been such strong denialism um, that I suspect there'll be more skepticism of Israeli justice by the people who are skeptical of the abundance of evidence that's available that the crimes occurred. And having other countries conduct parallel prosecutions might be helpful in um, dispelling that a little bit for people who need to be convinced more. One of the more, the last thing I'll say, one of the more interesting um, things that I think is, uh, to my eyes, is that 
despite everything I just said about the natural form being Israeli courts, um, quite a few families of hostages um, and other and people who were killed have turned to the International Criminal Court. Um, a couple of days ago, there was a submission of over a thousand pages by families of hostages and people who were killed by Hamas. This submission was made in The Hague um, at the ICC. Um, and at a press conference by the families and their lawyers, they talked about the symbolism of having the International Criminal Court prosecute these crimes. And, and, and again, I think it relates to what we've been talking about, a strong need for the international community itself to say, we believe you, this happened, and it should be condemned in the strongest terms. And so the people who brought that case, I think, feel that the ICC, whose jurisdiction um, the Israeli government doesn't recognize, but these victims feel, we need you. Um, in addition to any other prosecution going on, we want you, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, to recognize what happened to us. You're a vehicle for, for international condemnation of what happened. So it's a kind of a complex landscape um, and right. it will take some time uh, for indictments to come forth. Um, but but I think we'll see progress in multiple different court systems. So let and me perhaps, turn. Uh, I just want to yes. add perhaps on that, that we are we will be uh, making effort, uh, perhaps um, um, convincing the government that the best solution here is to establish a special tribunal, uh, perhaps a hybrid tribunal here in Israel that will consist of international uh, experts and local uh, judges that will be able to um, apply international law in ways that will be able to expose the kinds of crimes that we've seen to give, <laughs> um, yeah, to give, um, to reflect the crimes against humanity and um, we're hopeful that this will be considered seriously. So let me turn to um, turn to some of the questions uh, in the chat. Then, so let me start with this one from Anne Guinan. Has the sexual torture and murder of women and children, this extreme and systematic, ever been reported from another war? Uh, Diane, do you want to take that one? These questions are always really hard for me because um, horrific atrocities are being committed in so many places right now as we speak um, in Sudan and Ethiopia, uh, in Haiti um, as a result of the gang violence there. And, in, and as you mentioned earlier in Ukraine, um, and the more you learn about the facts in each of those countries, uh, the more horrified you have to be that said, I've been doing human rights work and documenting human rights violations for 40 years. And the details of Hamas's cruelty to women and men, there were some male victims of sexual violence, just um, chilled me um, and uh, to mix metaphors, you know, burned deep in my soul in a way that's, um, exceptional. It was exceptionally cruel and vicious, um, and just uh, soul shattering. So let me let me combine two of the questions here, because uh, we're getting short on time. Um, Ilya Rudiak, uh, Searle's uh, senior fellow, in fact, non-resident fellow, ask, um, uh, whether or not the denialist responses by the UN bodies to Hamas's horrific crimes uh, suggests a systematic problem, I assume he means with that body. Are there structural changes that you think should be made within the currently existing UN bodies to improve their responses? And are these bodies redeemable? And I want to combine that with the question about UNRWA, um, someone asked, why weren't UNRWA employees who participated in the massacres fired? Why weren't they arrested? Why haven't they been charged with murder? Um, so the revelations recently, uh, for those who haven't been following, I think most people have, uh, are that um, the uh, UN-affiliated organization, uh, UNRWA, 
has a, a number of employees have been found to have participated in the massacres. And uh, there have long been concerns about UNRWA. Some of the hostages were found housed uh, among UNRWA workers. Um, and of course, our State Department uh, ha continues to fund UNRWA, but is seriously discussing uh, cutting off or has uh, committed to cut off funding as of several years from now. Uh, however, the funding continues at present. So, so is there a structural problem here with the UN and what could be done about it? Uh, either, either of you who would like to respond to this. Rachel, why don't you go ahead since you've been dealing with various UN bodies. So uh, I think this is an excellent And if you can question. hold, I apologize for reminding you. It's so hard sorry, to- Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I think this is an excellent question. I really think it's an excellent question. It's a, a question that is going to occupy our uh, scholarship and all of us scholarship for the years to come because uh, really the UN requires radical reform. Um, and, and I think kind of the kind of issues we've discussed, for example, with you and women is the fact that, as I said, you and women does not have agencies uh, here in Israel. They have a very fueled system, not fueled. Um, they were able to uh, report everything that happened uh, in other areas in a very meticulous, uh, in, 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 a, in a very serious way. And here they were unable to even respond. Um, and I think uh, what we also want to see is uh, an independent investigation carried out and not the same investigative bodies that have proved biased against Israel in ways that are very concerning. I think um, I think this is really, it will take years to understand the kind of reforms that need to be taken and um, and the concepts that needs to lead at, that needs to lead the international criminal system, as I said, in light of those terrorists' attack. Uh, Diane, do you want to add anything to to that well, on the topic of the UN and reform? Yeah. Just specifically on the allegations against UNRWA, they're very serious and very disturbing, obviously. But UNRWA did react when it was presented with intelligence by the Israeli government and did fire employees against whom um, there was evidence of involvement with Hamas and immediately condemned it and undertook processes of accountability. Other governments, including the United States, similarly uh, took immediate steps, um, including suspending um, aid to UNRWA. And it uh, so it, it's very serious. Um, I, I wouldn't want to uh, underestimate how serious that is. But UNRWA has tens of thousands of employees in Gaza who uh, were not implicated. And, um, and, and, and so I think we need to have a very fact-based response to these allegations. We need to take them deeply seriously. We need to look deeper um, at, uh, you know, we're probably seeing the tip of the iceberg, but we're also talking about an agency that has been delivering a lifeline to Gazans. Um, particularly in the current conflict and we would be Gazans would be in uh, huge trouble if UNRWA collapsed right now um and so you know I think it's important that they responded immediately to the evidence and, and immediately took it seriously and responded um, with accountability processes of, of course this is very difficult because many people would say while well, they're delivering a lifeline to Gazans they're delivering a lifeline to Hamas as well and so this is a this is a very fraught uh, topic one that we may cover in a separate uh, briefing uh, Daphne Aviatar says why do you think so many established non-governmental US and international human rights organizations have ignored these crimes and she mentions in particular Amnesty International Human Rights Watch and I would add to that uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, the ACLU there is a very great uh, focus of course on the Palestinian cause among these organizations the Center for Constitutional Rights um, had filed a, a lawsuit against the US government for uh, for uh, its support of uh, Israel uh, in the current uh, conflict and um, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International uh, as well as CCR have put out reports accusing Israel of genocide um, so 
uh, how are we to understand the position of these organizations with respect to the issue of gender-based violence on October 7th? Uh, Kohab, do you want to take this up or? Uh, I'm sorry, Diane, or did you want to respond? Either one. I always defer to Kohab, so if you want to say something first, Kohab. So I want to say um, that I, yeah, let me, um, I want to say that um, Human Rights Watch have uh, drafted a report and I know that I they are drafting another report uh, now. Um, other human rights bodies uh, have shown um, difficulty to address those issues. I think what I, of what I understood uh, throughout the past few months that they need to explain their action or inaction and um, and they need to explain. Um, I can't really provide any input on that. Um, just to say that I'm hopeful. I don't, I, not only hopeful, uh, as Diane said, the kinds of crimes that we've seen are so horrific that they would need to address this for the sake of humanity, for the sake of preservation of, of universal values, of our really ability to protect future generations. And I'm positive that they will find ways out of this polarized uh, environment in the future, because this is really what matters. And can I say, um, I think Kochav indicated this already, but it's important to note, it's my understanding that Amnesty and Human Rights Watch were not entirely silent. They did get statements out condemning Hamas's violence relatively early. Um, and so they they were not entirely silent about this. Um, Physicians for Human Rights did a report which it put out about the uh, crimes of Hamas um, before it had met its usual um, uh, standard of standard, not standard of proof, but um, standards for fact finding before it publishes something because it felt that it was urgently important to get this out right away. Um, it it can be difficult, particularly in very polarized situations, to assess um, whether the relative balance of attention is what it should be. Um, but but the, but these organizations weren't entirely. Um, silent, um, and and I would encourage them to continue to document these abuses. I do think it's important to acknowledge that um, there is also a concern about the situation, the status of Palestinians, not just um, uh, the humanitarian crisis they face now in Gaza, but longstanding um, uh, problems of occupation and um and and you can support Israel's right to exist and still believe that um it's uh it's intolerable intolerable to continue um to have people live without an independent full democratic rights and so so I think some human rights organizations struggle to figure out the most effective way to address long running concerns and immediate um, violations of human rights. And, uh, you know, of course we can have legitimate concerns as well as disagreements about whether they've gotten that right. But I think there are a lot of factors going on um, behind their reporting. Thank you. So and I do want to mention just that in Gaza, just to clarify that in Gaza, the Hamas is, has uh, de facto control and it's uh, there is no uh, Israel is already withdraw from Gaza. Of course, the situation there is difficult, but just to uh, clarify on that. Yeah, that's a very important point. I was focusing on uh, the no, West Bank when I said and, that. And uh, yes, and, and I agree that those organizations, uh, especially physicians, um, were really um, we're really diligent in uh, exposing the, the gender-based crimes. So uh, one very quick last question, very important one from Kevin Govern, our uh, member of the Searle board, um, who says that there are allegations of um, reprisals against Palestinians making use of uh, sexual assaults. Um, I have not heard these. Um, allegations. Uh, have any such allegations, Kohav, come to your ears? 
and would any um, would the commission be focusing on that kind of uh, incidence of sexual violence if you were to hear such reports? I'm not sure I heard the beginning of the question. Reports uh, of reprisals against Palestinians making use of sexual violence. And uh, while he doesn't uh, say who the perpetrators are, I assume that uh, he may have heard reports of IDF use of sexual violence in reprisals. I have not, again, to stress, I have not seen such reports myself. Um, and I could also ask you if you have uh, not heard such reports, if any such reports came to your attention, would the commission address them? Um, so we are the commission, the civil commission on October 7th, crimes against women and children. And I think it is important to inquire these reports. And I think the IDF should do it. I'm not representing here the IDF or the government. So, yes. All right. That, that, that would be for the government to investigate potentially. Okay. Very good. Thanks to both of you uh, for coming on to discuss this extremely difficult and challenging topic. Uh, we will very much look forward, Kochav, to the results of the Commission's work, to learning more about it, uh, and to the light that you shed on this absolutely critical uh, uh, and endemic uh, problem incident to war. And uh, Diane, uh, of course, your work has been extraordinary in this area, and we're so grateful to both of you uh, for the work that you were doing to bring this to the world's attention and hopefully to help achieve justice for the victims. Thank you, Thank you to both of us, to both of you. And our next briefing will be in two weeks and we'll be focusing on the question of perfidy uh, and the question of uh, what kinds of operations um, are acceptable uh, in areas both of conflict and outside of conflict and looking at some of the intelligence practices uh, used in uh, the current conflict uh, to understand what is permissible and what may violate the laws of war. Uh, I turn it back to Dave uh, Johnson, our executive director. Yes, thank you, Claire. Um, and thank all of you for joining us today. This event recording will be available on Searle's YouTube channel shortly. As Claire mentioned, our next briefing will be held on February 29th at 12 p.m. Eastern. Stay tuned for uh, additional information about such this briefing. And you can also keep advised by joining Searle's mailing list. The link to sign up is available in the chat, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.